Hello, I'm Robert Lomas, and this is the fifth of 17 episodes of a work called Ten Nights in the Black Lion, which was written by the novelist Daniel Owen in 1859. It was originally written as a serial in a magazine called Charles Abala, which was produced by his friend Nathaniel Jones, and it was first published on May the 7th, 1859. Episode 5 The Third Evening the evening after the painful incident with Joe Morgan's child, Harvey Green was sitting in the bar talking to Simon Slade. "'Don't see your dear friend Joe Morgan here tonight,' said Green. "'No,' came the answer from the man who had endured the horrific reverie and shock. "'But if he comes to my house again, no matter how badly he pleads, he's tested my friendship too far, and I've decided he will never drink here again. I've suffered his bad-mouthing long enough, but I don't want any more.' Last night was the worst of all. What if I'd accidentally killed his child? Well, I'm sure you'd be in deep trouble. I'm sure I would. What business does that child have coming here every night? A pretty thing like her must have a good-looking mother, said Green, with a contemptuous smile. I don't know what she's like now, said Slade, his voice sounding a little nostalgic. He's probably broken her heart. I couldn't look at her last night. I felt quite sick. There was a time when Fanny Morgan was the most beautiful and brightest woman in Cedarville. I'll always say that about her. What a pitiable place her husband has brought her to. It would be better if he died and was out of the way, said Green. Perhaps if I wrung his neck one night out of the kindness of my heart, it would be a great blessing to his family, replied Slade. And for you as well, asked Green, laughing. You can be sure of that, said Slade calmly. Now let's leave the bar of the Black Lion and these helpless talkers to take a look at Joe Morgan's family and see what we found in the home of the poor drunkard. There we are transported in the blink of an eye. Joe? The thin hand of Mrs Morgan grabbed hold of her husband, who had suddenly stood up and was moving towards the half-open door. Oh, don't go out tonight, Joe. Don't, Joe dear. Father, please. A soft and gentle voice called from the corner of the room where little Mary was lying, her bruised head bandaged. "'Well, I won't go,' said Joe in a gentle tone, overwhelmed by his daughter's encouragement. "'Sit by me, father.' How gentle and effective was her low but sweet voice. "'Yes, sweetheart. Take hold of my hand, father.' Joe took hold of little Mary, and she gripped his hand tightly. Don't go and leave me tonight. You will stay, won't you? How hot your hand is, my dear. Do you have a headache? A little, but it will get better. The child's bright and penetrating eyes stared with love and awe at her father's grumpy and swollen face. Oh, dear father. What is it, my child? Will you promise me something? What's that, Mary? Will you promise me, father? Well, I don't know until I hear. I will if I can. Oh, you can, you can, father. What is it, Mary? Never again go to Simon Slade's house. The innocent child sat up to get closer to her father. Joe shook his head, and poor Mary dropped back on her pillow with a sigh. Her eyes closed, and her long blonde eyelashes rested on her pale cheeks. Well, I won't go there tonight, don't worry. Mary opened her eyes, and two tears were released from their prison to slowly roll down her face. Thank you, father. Thank you. How proud my mother will be. She closed her eyes again, and her father moved back and forth excitedly. His heart was wounded. There was some terrific battle going on within him. He almost says, I'll never go to the Black Lion to drink again. But his will's not strong enough to allow his lips to speak these words. Father? Well, love? I don't think I can come out to fetch you for three or four days. You know the doctor told me to stay in bed while the fever is heavy. Yes, he said so, Mary. Now I want you to promise me one thing. What, please? Don't go out at night until I'm better. Joe hesitated. Please, father. It won't be long. I'll soon be well. Joe Morgan could do nothing but obey a directive. I promise. I adore you, Mary. Now go to sleep. I don't want the fever to get worse. 
Oh, it's good to be alive. It's so good to be alive, Mary said. Mrs Morgan had been a silent witness to this conversation, but knowing the influence the child had over her father, she came over to him and placed her hand on his shoulder, saying, I'm sure you feel better now you've made that promise. Joe looked at her and smiled. He did feel better, but he wasn't willing to admit it. Shortly afterwards, Mary fell asleep. Mrs Morgan saw her husband was getting upset. He kept jumping to his feet and walking across the room as if he'd lost something. Then he sat down, sighing and staring and saying, Oh dear! This is what the drink did to him. How can that beast of his insatiable desire for the drink be satiated? This was the question that came into the mind of Mrs Morgan. Poor Joe. His wife understood his condition and felt sorry for him. But what could she do for him? Go out to get him a drink? Oh no, never! An hour passed, and Joe's agitation increased. What could she do? Mrs Morgan left the room. She had decided what to do. He had been distressed for too long. Now she came back, some five minutes later, with a cup of strong coffee in her hand. Oh, you really are good to me, Fanny, said Morgan with a cheerful smile as he took the cup. But his hand trembled, so he spilt some of the coffee as he lifted the cup to his lips. Oh, what devastating effects the drinking of spirits has wrought in his constitution. His wife's hand holds the cup to his mouth, and he drinks with pleasure. Incessant tears stream from Mrs Morgan's eyes. Her husband is much overdosed and intoxicated with drunkenness, and Mrs Morgan knows that a brief abstinence will be followed by another attack of this dangerous disease. She gives him the coffee to alleviate his pain, and for a time it works. His discomfort eases, and a stillness settles over his body and his mind. "'Why don't you go to bed, Joe?' she says. He goes at once. He falls asleep after a few minutes, and his heavy breathing shows he's in the world of dreams. At this point there was a knock on the door. "'Come in,' Fanny said. The door was pushed open, and Simon Slade's wife stood there. "'Mrs. Slade?' Fanny, how are you tonight? Fair to middling, thank you. They shook hands kindly, and for a few seconds stared into each other's eyes. How is little Mary tonight? Not so good, I'm afraid. The further is burning her up. Truly. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Poor Mary. Oh, Fanny, you don't know how this thing has troubled me. I've been thinking all day I should come to see you, but I couldn't. Yes, she was nearly killed, said Mrs. Morgan. The mercy of God saved her, said Mrs. Slade, taking a chair and sitting by the fireside where Mary lay. She stared intently at the child's face and saw her lips moving. She was talking in her sleep. She talked about Simon Slade, about her father, and her return home. Her face was fluttering. She moaned. She threw her arms about restlessly. Mrs. Slade was shocked at what she heard. Mary said that Mr. Slade was angry with her. She remembers how he used to take her on his knee and stroke her hair when he kept the mill, but not now. She says she wishes that her father wouldn't go to Mr. Slade's house, and she shouts in an excited voice, Don't, Mr. Slade! Oh, my head, my head! More exclamations followed in an incoherent way before she breathed quietly. But the flush didn't go from her cheeks, and when Mrs. Slade from whose eyes there was a constant rolling of tears, held her hand gently to her face. She felt the little girl to be hot with fever. Has the doctor seen her today, Fanny? No, ma'am. He should see her immediately. I'll go and fetch him, Mrs Slade said. She hurried from the room. After a few minutes, she returned with Dr Green. He sat down and stared at the child's face with a thoughtful look. Then he felt her pulse. He shook his head looking even more serious. How long has she had the fever? he asked. All day, sir. You should have sent for me sooner. Oh, doctor, is she in danger? Mrs. Morgan said, sounding frightened. She's very sick, Mrs. Morgan. Then the child spoke. You promise, father. I'm not yet better. Don't go, father, don't go. That's it. Well, 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 I must go there. Oh, dear, how weak I am. Father! Father! The child jumped up, looking agitated. 
Oh, mother, is that you? She leaned back on her pillow a second time, looking anxiously from face to face. Father, where's my father? she asked. Asleep, sweetheart. Oh, is it so? Then I'm good. She closed her eyes. Do you feel any pain, Mary? asked the doctor. Yes, my head. It hurts so. The cry of father had reached the ears of Joe Morgan, who was sleeping in the next room. He recognised the doctor's voice, asking, Do you feel any pain? He heard the question clearly, and the child's weak answer. He was sober enough for his fears to be stirred immediately. There was nothing in the world that mattered more to him than his child. He jumped out of bed and straightened his clothes as quickly as he could, his face and body tense with anxiety. Oh, Daddy! Mary's perceptive hearing quickly detected his arrival in the room. She welcomed him with a cheerful smile. Is she really bad, Doctor? asked Joe in a worried voice. She's quite poorly, sir. You should have sent for me sooner. The doctor sounds disapproving, and Morgan feels the force of the reprimand in his heart. After a more detailed examination, the doctor gave the child some medicine and promised to call early the next day, and left. Mrs. Slade soon followed him, but as she was leaving she put something in Mrs. Morgan's hand. To the surprise of the latter, it turned out to be ten pounds. The tears welled up in Fanny's eyes as she clutched the treasure to her bosom, whispering, God bless you. This act of repayment from Mrs. Slade originated from humanity as well as justice. With one hand her husband had taken the bread from the mouths of their friend's family, and she, like the other hand, had given it back. That's the end of the fifth episode of Ten Nights in the Black Lion, written by Daniel Owen. It was first published in the magazine Charles Abella on May the 7th, 1859. I'm Robert Lomas, and I've spent the last year translating this. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please click the subscribe box in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen.